Well, hello and welcome again to our online Bible study that we call God's Message to the Church in These Last Days. And we were looking, we've been looking the last couple of sessions at the church at Philadelphia. I think it's so important, you know, some of the concepts and ideas that we've been discussing with this church. We were talking about holiness and what holiness means and that the that God has a purpose for the church in these last days. And as it says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, that this gospel of the kingdom, not just good news, but the good news of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, must be preached in all the world and then the end shall come. It is so important that the church preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Remember when Jesus came the first time, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He was letting them know that he, as the Son of God, the Son of Man, was coming to introduce if you will, the kingdom of God and to lay down the principles and if you want to call it laws or the foundations for the kingdom of God here upon this earth. And he gave several parables and teachings that dealt with the kingdom of God is like. And he made comparisons to things that the people could relate to because the important thing is that even if we go into this time of tribulation and then the wrath of God, when God pours out His wrath upon an unrepentant world, that God still has a purpose and a plan for this world in which we live. This is not the end of the world but it will be the end of the age as we know it now. The end of the age when Satan has ruled and reigned. He's been the prince of the power of the air. But once this period of tribulation and wrath comes upon the earth, then Jesus will come and set up his millennial reign here upon the earth. And it will be a time, just like as we talked about when we were studying in Zechariah, it was a time for Zechariah and his people to rebuild and restore the nation of Judah and Jerusalem and the temple. It was a time of restoration, of removing the rubble and, and getting the house of the Lord built. The same, that's a picture of what it will be like here after the tribulation and after the wrath of God is poured out upon this earth. Then it's going to be a time of restoration, a time of rebuilding and making this world what God intended the world to be like in the very beginning when he gave Adam dominion over the world. Jesus, as the second Adam, will rule with a rod of iron. And it will be a time, a thousand year period, where there will be peace, where there will be safety and security and protection, where there will not be lawlessness, where there will not be any demonic activity. Satan will be bound for those thousand years. And just imagine what life will be without satanic activity on the earth for a thousand years. Wouldn't that be glorious? And there's the uh, life will continue and people will thrive and build cities and re restore or rebuild this earth that we know that is being devastated by man at the present time by those who are ungodly 
And we are living in an ungodly era where there is wickedness and corruption in high places. God is exposing this for what it is. This political season that we've been in here in America is just the tip of the iceberg to let us know what is actually happening that maybe we're not even aware of. We're not being told. We have a media that is giving propaganda and that is not telling us the truth, not showing us what is really happening with those in high places. But God is exposing it. And God is going to, again, He wants the church to be His instrument of bringing about this restoration that is to come. We are to give people hope and let them know that, yes, things are terrible or bad or uh, evil in the world in which we're living today. But this will be for just a limited time, a limited period. But we are to be God's instruments of providing a, a hope for the future and letting people know that once we get beyond this period of time, then this will usher in a glorious age, a glorious time where righteousness and peace and love and all the things that we long for will be accomplished and Jesus will use some of us also to rule and reign with him here upon this earth that those who have been faithful those who have been true those that have used what the Lord has given to them and has increased it. In other words, you know, the, you think about the parable of the talents. Where Jesus said to one, what have you done with the talents that I've given to you? And they said, well, I've invested it and I have increased it. And he says, well done, you, you good and faithful servant. I'll make you ruler over five cities or ten cities. In other words, in the millennial reign, he says... I will reward you by giving you the opportunity to rule and reign with me in the, in the earth. And that is a special, a special and a glorious promise that God is making to his church. But I preface all this to say that the church needs to get ready because a lot of people have been taught, most of us have been taught that we're going to be raptured out of here before anything bad happens and we won't have to go through it and God is going to just zap us and take us to heaven and, and we won't have to worry about any of this. But in reality, that's not how it's going to, uh, to go down. For many years I believed this because that's what had been taught. And I just said, well, maybe they know something I don't. But it's not what I read when I read in the scriptures. That's not how I saw it. I was hoping that that would be the case. But now as we see un th uh, things unfold around us, I realize that Jesus said, in this world you're going to have tribulation. And Jesus also shared with his disciples about what would take place, about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and pestilences and persecution and, and deception and uh, then the heavens being shaken and the moon and the sun and the stars will all be shaken. All of these things that he mentioned and, and he said that after this tribulation, that's when you'll see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. So it'll be after all of these events and circumstances and these, this great tribulation that he describes, that's when he will appear. Why? Because the church is not ready. The church has been asleep at the wheel. The church, think about this, at 9-11, this was a wake-up wake up call for the church God was trying to get our attention as a nation and saying look you need to repent this 
this really devastated a lot of people when they saw that there was a breach in our security as a nation when we realized that how could this happen we are you know the superpower of the world how could just a, a small group of people do all this collateral damage there in New York City and at the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania how could just a small group of people do all this damage and it just floored people for a while and and for a few weeks people were flocking to churches wanting some answers and unfortunately the church didn't have any answers the church didn't know what to tell people because the church had become so politically correct so conditioned by the world and had not been preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ to their congregations not teaching them what was to come you know a lot of churches don't even want to uh, talk about prophecy or revelation and they're saying no that causes all kinds of divisions or whatever can we lay aside all of our doctrinal differences because when Jesus returns he wants to come for a bride that is without spot without blemish he wants a church that is holy and set apart and not like the world and unfortunately there are so many churches that they want to throw down or throw other churches uh, under the bus they want to criticize and point fingers and and condemn the doctrines and teachings of others but that's not our job that's the Holy Spirit's job we are to as far as our responsibility is to proclaim what God has said to our people but God will judge those who are just in it for the wrong motivation for the wrong reasons for the wrong purposes God is coming or Jesus is coming for a church that's without spot without blemish that is pure in heart you know Jesus said this blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God did you know there's going to be some people that will go to heaven but they will not have the opportunity of seeing God because they have not been pure in heart now they'll be able to see Jesus but they won't be able to see God the Father won't be able to go to the throne room of heaven because they have not been purified in their heart now I think it's going to be a process that Jesus is going to teach even those who are in heaven who made it to heaven you know like the thief on the cross he didn't have a lot of teaching did he I mean that was a last moment decision on this man's part but I believe that Jesus is teaching and training this man in heaven and getting him to that place where he needs to be but not everybody will be able to see the Lord the Father at the throne room because our hearts have not been pure blessed are the peacemakers so those who are bringing about confusion and conflict and church splits and all these things those who um, as we talked about earlier this doctrine of the Nicolaitans where there are people who like to control other people who like to be the one in charge to love love to have a certain title and say I am superior to you and you have to answer to me you have to uh, do what I tell you to do Jesus came as a servant he came and he washed the disciples feet he came as a shepherd he didn't come to lord it over people and we're not to lord it over people either we are to be truly humble in spirit and we are to serve one another in love we are to consider others more than ourselves we are to lay down our lives for our brother 
no, you know, there's no greater love than that. We need to learn the principles and take the example that Jesus set before us. That's the kind of church that he wants to come back for. That's what he's looking for. If you look in the Song of Solomon, for example, this is a picture of the church and of the Good Shepherd and how the Shulamite woman is representative of the church and how she is just concerned about herself. She doesn't care about the world. She doesn't care about the harvest of the world. She doesn't want to go with the shepherd into the field to the harvest. She just wants to stay and lay in her bed and enjoy the comforts of home. But she doesn't want to get out of her comfort zone. You can read it. Read the Song of Solomon and it will tell you. She, can, she says that she loves the shepherd, but at the same time she uh, does, refuses to go with the shepherd into the field. She wants to stay where she is. So, again, the message is that the church is going to have to be purified the church is going to have to be refined. The Lord is going to come back. But when He does, we can't go to the marriage supper of the Lamb until we have been purified, until we have become more and more in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And in the days in which we're living, in these trying and difficult days, and from what I'm hearing, the days are going to become more and more difficult as we go along. There will be signs in the heavens. There's a man that works for the federal government, and I've been listening to him. He has the intel. He knows things that the public has not been made aware of. And one of those things is that there will be a shaking in the heavens. He has been saying that there is five waves of energy. Last year was the first wave, but he says on December the 26th of this year, there's going to be a great shaking. That we are a binary system. That that means that there are two suns. And that we are getting more and more in alignment with this second star or this second sun, if you will. And that will cause problems here on the earth. Because this second star is powerful and has, just like we're so interconnected with our sun, this sun will interconnect with our sun and... Um, because of its strength, he says that it will suck the helium and the hydrogen out of our sun, and for three days there will be total darkness. Just like the plague in Egypt, when there were three days of darkness. He says that's when this happened before. So this was thousands of years ago, that an event like this happened. He said this is exactly what happened during the Egyptian plagues is that this uh, other star, this other sun, if you will, was in alignment with our sun and it sucked the helium and hydrogen out of our sun. And what will be the effects of this? He says for a hundred or so days after this there will be auroras, there will be an uptick in earthquakes, volcanic activity, the earth will heat up, and there will be much devastation in the earth. And I know that the church is not ready for this. And 
the news media and NASA and the other agencies, they don't want to alarm people, so they're not going to tell us about it until it's too late. And then what do you do? What can you do? Except what it says in nine, uh, Psalms 91. Those that dwell in the secret place of the Almighty shall abide under the shadow of the Lord. It says that He will cover us with His feathers and under His wings we will find protection. He will send His angels and give charge over them that they would keep us and that a thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand but it will not come near us. The world is living in a time of great darkness right now. Can we affect, can we change this? Perhaps we can, but then prophecy must be fulfilled. And things are lining up quickly for this to happen. But we need to be prayed up. We need to be purified. We need, the, you know, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, I believe it is, where the writer of Hebrews, and some think it was the Apostle Paul, that he said that there would be a shaking, a shaking of the heavens and the earth. And there will be. And life as we know it will not be the same. It will be a time of great tribulation. So, church, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Our hearts need to be pure before the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray for each and every one that is listening to this message that this will not just be words that will fall to the ground, but that it will have fertile ground that will take root and that each and every one of us will examine our own hearts and our lives and we will draw close to you, that we will turn to you and seek your face and that we will seek to do your will and your purposes here on this earth. I ask that we would open our ears and our hearts and give us thoughts as to what we need to do. Prepare us, Lord, for the days to come. And give us courage and help us to stand firm in the midst of the darkness that surrounds us. To shine, to arise and shine, even as it says in Isaiah, I believe that's chapter 60 of Isaiah. That it's our day for the church to arise and shine. Even as the novel that says, The Tale of Two Cities, where it says, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. We have to realize that we need to let our light shine bright in the midst of the darkness around us. That it will be a time of great disaster, but it also will be a, a time of great revival as well. So may we prepare our hearts and our minds for the days to come. In Jesus' name. As it says there in Malachi chapter 3 verse 3, it says, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites. That's the ministers. You see, one thing the ministers of churches need to be purified. The division of the church. God is not pleased with this. God is not pleased with, pleased with our criticism of one another, our fault finding. He's not pleased with our backbiting. He's not pleased with the fact that there are ministers, in this case called Levites, that are just in it for what they get out of it, for the money or whatever, or just their position, or just because they like the title that they receive, they like the adulation of the people. Here he says, I want to purify the Levites. You see, 
we have to have true shepherds, those who really care about the flock, those who are seeking the lost and are bringing them, putting them on their shoulder and bringing them back to the fold, who care enough about their people, their flock, that they want to minister to them, heal their hurts and their bruises, who uh, are concerned about their souls and are bringing them to the foot of the cross and saying, you need to get the sin out of your life. We can't just allow sin to be in our congregation and think that God is going to bless our congregations if we're not teaching the people that we need to live holy and righteous lives we need to have pure lives before the Lord you know like Isaiah he saw a vision of the Lord high and lifted up and he says woe is me I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips we have to realize that as we, when we stand in the presence of the Lord, just think about that. Think about it. When you stand in the presence of the Lord, what will you do? What will you do? What will you do when you stand in His presence? And He is holy, holy, holy. There are seraphim who guard the holiness of the Lord. The seraphim, they are the burning ones. They are filled with a fire. You know, on the day of Pentecost, it said that there was fire, like tongues of fire that came upon all the people that were there in the upper room who were praying together. The fire of the Holy Spirit that will burn and give us a zeal, but also it purifies and cleanses. That's what he says, he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. See, gold and silver are very valuable and very precious, but they can have impurity that surrounds them and covers them, but you put them in the fire to burn off all the impurities. And when we get into the presence of the Lord, that's what happens is that all the impurities are to be burned off in our lives, melted away, come to the surface so that they can be skimmed off. And then it says the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. When we come with clean hands and a clean heart before the Lord, then we will bring offerings of righteousness unto Him. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the church at Ephesus in chapter 5 and verses 26 and 27. This is what the Lord wants to do. That He might sanctify and cleanse it, talking about the church, with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Is the church holy and without blemish? Is there envy? Is there jealousy? Is there rudeness? Is there backbiting? Is there gossip? Is there complacency? Is there rebelliousness? This is not the church that the Lord is looking for. Is there fightings and quarrelings? That's not the church that the Lord is looking for. Is there a church that is steeped in immorality? That's not the church that the Lord is coming for. He can't come until the church gets its act together. And what will bring that about? I believe it will come when there comes a great shaking. 
when life as we know it turns upside down. And of course, at that time, those who are not true Christians will fall away. The Bible says there will be a great falling away. But what will remain will be solid, will be pure, will be righteous, will be holy. They will turn to the Lord. We will turn to the Lord and seek His face because He is our only refuge. He only is our protection and our help in our time of need. So the day is coming, people. Get ready. Get ready. God is looking for this right here that the Apostle Paul is talking about. That it should be holy and without blemish. And the church is not there yet. But the Lord loves the church. And He wants to mold and shape and purify and refine the church. Because He loves the church. That's why it calls the event the bride of Christ he calls the church the bride of Christ and it talks about the marriage supper of the lamb this is how God wants our a relationship with us that's the kind of relationship that he wants it's a very intimate loving relationship and that's what he's going to have when he returns but we're not there yet so we haven't got past verse 7 how the Lord identifies himself to the church there at Philadelphia he says he is the one who is holy and that means as we said before it means that we're set apart we're sanctified in contrast to the many gods that were represented in the city of Philadelphia. And there are many gods that are worshipped in our country, by the way. There are witches and warlocks and Luciferians and those that are delving into the demonic realms in our world. So there are multitudes of gods that are out there that are being worshipped. But he says he is the one who is true. He's dependable, he's genuine, he's real, he's faithful. As you see there in the picture, this is some of the ruins that you see in Philadelphia. So Jesus is reminding the church there at Philadelphia that he is holy and he is true. And when we look at the word true in the ancient Greek language, there's two uh, translations of true. One means true and not false, and the other means true and not fake. And the word that's used here has the idea of real or genuine. Jesus is the real deal. You know, the Vatican today is promoting a one world religion. This is part of the beast system that it talks about in Revelation. Religion is a very powerful force. What people believe is what motivates them to do the things that they do. But the Vatican is promoting that it doesn't matter what you believe, just so long as you believe something. And they are promoting a one world religion to embrace the Muslims, to embrace the Hindus, to Buddha, whatever, all the religions of the world under one umbrella and we just need to get together and understand one another and love one another well yes we can love and, and we can respect and it doesn't mean that we're mean or mean spirited that's not what God has called his people to be we are to love even our enemies Jesus said but it doesn't mean that we embrace their ideology or what they worship now, of course, the, um, the Vatican does not want to embrace Judaism or certain people in Christianity who believe that there is only one God. You see, for 
the one world government to work, you have to have people in one accord as, as to their belief systems. So you have to get their belief systems. You have to mesh them together and let them cooperate with one another and say we can get along with one another. We can work together and build a new world. But this is trying to build a new world without Christ, without Jesus, without the Anointed One. And we are His anointed if we're truly born again. The only way that there can be peace on the earth is for the Prince of Peace to come. And He hasn't come yet. But He's coming. That day is coming. He's the real deal. You know, some people say, well, you know, Jesus was a good man. He's a good teacher etc etc but they don't want to accept him as the son of God even the Muslims say that Jesus was a prophet but that when he comes back he will come with their Messiah and he will point people to their Messiah so they you know other religions they respect Jesus as a prophet or a good man that he did a lot of good things but they don't accept him as the Son of God. And that's the difference. Is he who he says he is? Or is he not? Is he the real deal? I think it goes back to Elijah when he challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He said, choose this day whom you're going to serve. If it's the Lord, then serve him. That's, you know, Joshua said this, but the same idea with Elijah years later. That was the challenge. Who is the real God? Let's prove it. Let's prove it. And when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal, they lost. They couldn't bring down fire from heaven. Their God could not produce this. But Elijah said, keep pouring the water on Fill it up. Fill up the trenches that surrounds the altar. And then he prayed and the fire fell. And it consumed all the altar, uh, the sacrifice on the altar. And the people said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. In other words, the Lord is the real deal. He's genuine. He is true. And we have to make that decision is the Lord who He says He is, or is He not? Who are we going to serve? And if there are people that are willing to die for what they believe in, what about us? Are we willing to stand up for Christ? Or have we caved in to political correctness for so long that we are so weak-kneed that we're so afraid that we might offend people. Well, the Bible says that the gospel is offensive to those who are perishing. It will be offensive to people. But to those who receive salvation, it's a precious jewel. It is life. It is abundant life when we receive the real deal. So we can't preach a watered down gospel, a message. We can't be afraid of offending people. If you study the life of Jesus, you will see that he offended people all the time. But it didn't bother him. He continued on. Those who were true disciples of Him stuck with Him to the very end and even beyond. Are we true disciples and apostles of the Lord? Are we just hanging on for the blessings that we want Him to give us? Or are we willing to take up our cross and follow Him? That's their choice. Is he the real deal? Is he genuine? 
Is he true? Is he, is he the one that he claims that he is or not? The decision is ours. What are we going to do with this man called Jesus Christ? Are we just going to honor him as a good teacher? A good man who did a lot of good deeds? Or are we going to worship him and acknowledge him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings? And is he the Lord of our lives? Jesus said count the cost. Count the cost. You may have to pay a price. There are people in the world today, Christians in the Middle East, who have had to count the cost. It has cost them their very lives to say that they are Christians. They've been beheaded. They've been tortured. They've been stuffed in the or uh, ovens and burnt alive. But they have not renounced the name of Christ. Can we say the same? Are we willing to take that stand for the Lord? Is He the real deal or not? If He is, then there is an eternity to gain then the promises that He has given us is true. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. So if we die, we know that He's prepared a place for us. And He says, I will come again. He will. He's coming for His bride, His church. Is He the real deal or not in your life? Are you willing, are we willing to live our lives in such a way that we're not ashamed of the gospel and we're not ashamed to proclaim it that He is Lord, He is my Savior, He is my Redeemer, He is my friend, He's one that sticks closer than a brother, He's my Redeemer, He's my Deliverer, He is the soon coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was there in the beginning. He will be there when it's all said and done as far as this age is concerned. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the Almighty. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man. He is who He claims to be. These things says He who is holy. He's set apart. He's not like the world. Definitely not like the world. He was here on a mission. And He has appointed us for such a time as this. Remember the story of Esther. She was given a choice. It could have meant the annihilation of the Jewish people at that time by the Persian Empire. But God positioned her. Nobody knew her true identity. She, they didn't know she was Jewish. But a high level official in the government of Persia had convinced the king that the Jews needed to be annihilated. And the king had given him permission to do whatever he wanted to do. But the king didn't know that Queen Esther, his queen, was Jewish. She had kept her identity a secret. And for too long, I guess that's the way the church has been. We've kept our true identity a secret to the world. But are we willing to pay that price? Because when her adopted father told her look you've got to do something about this situation or our people are going to perish and he says don't think just because you're there in the king's palace that you will be exempt from this but he said who knows but you've come to the uh, to this position for such a time as this and to do so to intervene on their behalf, it meant that she was going to have to reveal her true identity, that she was Jewish. 
So she asked her adopted father, she says, well, get the people together and fast and pray for me for three days. And then I'll go to the king. And if I perish, I perish. She had to make that decision, that choice. I have to intervene on behalf of my people. But it may mean my death to do that. So I have to make that decision. Yeah, I'm scared. But fast and pray for me. And I'll go to the king. And whatever happens, happens. So she went to the king. In fear and trepidation. But with the backing of many prayers. And she was able to deliver her people from annihilation. Are we willing to pay that price in the day and age in which we live? Have we made that determination that Jesus is the real deal? And if He is the real deal, will we lay down our lives for Him? Will we stand for Him? When we begin next time, we'll be looking at the rest of of verse 7 because it says these are the words of him who is holy and true who holds the key of David what he opens no one can shut and what he shuts no one can open we'll talk about the key of David next time Heavenly Father I just pray for the church that we would get our act together I pray Lord that we would become like Queen Esther. We have to overcome whatever fear that we may have of revealing our true identity, our true loyalty, that we are your child and that we're not ashamed of you and that we will confess your name before others. Jesus, you have said that if we confess your name before others that you will confess us before the Father and before the angels. I pray for courage, Lord. I pray for wisdom. And I pray for your will to be done here on this earth, even as it is in heaven. There's no fear, no tears, no sorrow, no sadness in heaven, no pain. No suffering in heaven. And I pray for that to happen here on this earth. I pray for the day when you will return and set up your kingdom here upon this earth. A kingdom of righteousness. A kingdom of peace. A kingdom of blessing. With you at the helm. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your promises. Thank you for your love. Hallelujah. Praise be to your holy name. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.